just wanted to share a little something personal. I believe that tonight's message, um, there's just going to be a special anointing on this message. And I'm going to share something with you that's very close to my heart. March 8th of this year, also known as International Woman's Day. I have had two heroes in the faith that have mentored me to this point in my life. I have had two women who have been pastor's wives that have stood the test of time. One went on to be with the Lord many, many years ago, but one has encouraged me in ways that I cannot even begin to tell you. This woman believed in me more than any woman in my entire life has believed in me. She saw this ministry in a dream one morning before this ministry ever existed. I was in the finance industry at that point. I printed that dream out and I saved it. And we were texting um, a lot over since Christmas and um, over after Easter, I'm going to be able to go home back to Phoenix and spend some time with my mom there and my dad. And I was actually supposed to spend some time with her. But on International Woman's Day, she went to be with the Lord. And I thought, I cried like I've never cried that day. I grieved, I have continued to grieve, and I mourn an emptiness, a loss inside of my heart. But I knew that tonight I was going to dedicate this message to Pastor Sharon Rome, and I want her to know that tonight her dream has come to pass, and that tonight the word of the Lord will be shared. So Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for sisterhood. We thank you, God, for strong women. Lord, strong women in you, God. Not strong in ourself, but Lord, I thank you, God, for women that know how to speak life into other women. Lord, I thank you, God, for women that know how to see the best in other women even when they can't see it in themselves. Lord, I thank you, God, for women that look other women in the eyes and say, it is time for you to cast off chains. It is time for you to cast off insecurity. It is time for you to cast off bondage and be all that God has called you to be because it is for such a time as this. And so, Lord, I give every moment of the rest of the time that we have together to you. And God, I pray that when we leave and exit these back doors, that you will receive all the glory, all the praise, and Lord, that we will say, we have been with you. We have been with our kids. We have been with our Savior, and we thank you for that. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. So a couple of years ago, uh, during uh, this time that we're in right now called Lent, Lent is the 40 days prior to Easter on the religious church calendar. And during this time, I try to pick a book of the Bible to read through. And a couple of years ago, I read through the book of Exodus, and it absolutely changed my life. It became one of my favorite books of the Bible, and it talks about the Israelites. Israelites, who were the people of God, the chosen people of God. They were living in Egypt under slavery, and God raised up a leader for them who was said, now is the time for these people to be free. Now is the time for these people to go out into freedom and into their promised land that God had promised them their lands of freedom. Their leader's name was Moses. And Moses approaches Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, who was the leader of the Egyptians, also known as their slave master, their taskmaster. And he asked to let the Israelites go. He says, now is the time for our people to go into their own land. And Pharaoh says, no. And God speaks to Moses and says, you tell Pharaoh to let my people go or I'm going to turn all the water in the lands of Egypt into blood. And so that happens. And Pharaoh says, 
go, go. If, go, if, you, if this plague will be released and the water will come back, then you can go. And so that happens. And as many of you know the story, all of a sudden, Pharaoh changes his mind and goes, never mind, and says, that's not happening this time. And so once again, Moses goes before Pharaoh and says, you have to let these people go. And he says, no. And then there comes frogs, frogs everywhere. Now, just in case you need to know this, my God has a sense of humor. Why did he choose frogs? I mean, can you imagine frogs everywhere? This plague of frogs. It was so bad that Pharaoh said, go, get rid of the frogs. And this game goes on 10 times. Lice. Oh my gosh, women. Have we had daughters have had lice? By the grace of God, and in Jesus' name, I pray that by saying this, this is not. I have three daughters. Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We have not dealt with lice in our house. Um, I, you know, now that I'm just saying this, we might just homeschool forever. <laughs> like, we, we might, yes. I just can't imagine. Can you imagine lice? So anyway, uh, lice. And then um, flies was the next plague. Flies. Yes, as much as I love summer, I don't like the flies that come with summer. And then all of their livestock, their food became ill-born with pest and pestilence. And here's a bad one. Boils. I'm talking skin disease upon all of them. You would think by now Pharaoh would be getting the picture. God is serious. The timing is now. My people are to be released. And then he sends hail. Oh, can you imagine the hailstorm? And he sends locusts. And then he sends darkness. Can't get any work done in darkness. And the last is finally the killing of the firstborn children. It was this brutal moment that the Jewish people still remember to this day called Passover. That the Israelites were able to leave their terrible lives of slavery. But as they were leaving, as they were leaving, this time they were on the road. Pharaoh sends his armies to capture the Israelites and the Israelites think they are to freedom until they get to the edge of the Red Sea. And in front of them is a vast Red Sea. And behind them is the Egyptian army coming to take them captive again. And it is at that moment that many of us have read in children's books before that God does the impossible and he parts the Red Sea. I mean, could you imagine? Don't you want to see that tape in heaven one day? Don't you want to stand before God and say, just show me the, put it on the big screen, God. I want to see that Red Sea part. And I want to see millions of Israelites cross over on dry ground. And you know, as the Israelite army came in, that sea just went straight in on them. And the Egyptians, Egyptian army is gone and the Israelites are free. But on the other side of the Red Sea, what you need to know is completely the unknown to the Israelites. For 430 years, they had been in slavery. All they knew was slavery. But God said, don't worry, I've gone before you. I'm going to lead you step by step. And so he led them in the daytime by a cloud that told them where to go, what to do next. And at nighttime, it says there was a pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness. They were not able to pack enough food or water for that many people for that time. And the Lord provided water for them in the wilderness. He provided manna daily. He provided quail for them daily. Every one of their needs was met in the wilderness. And this Lent season, I'm reading through the book of Joshua. See, Exodus was about the Israelites exiting Egypt. But Joshua is about the next generation of Israelites entering and taking possession of their promised land. 
See, what you need to know is the people in Exodus who saw God move in ways that we can never imagine. With the, those Israelites, the first generation, saw God provide for them in miraculous ways. They never got to enter into the promised lands. In fact, God says that he allowed that generation that he had promised the, um, the promised land to, to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they died off. And it was their offspring, the next generation, led by Moses' assistant, A. Joshua, who got to see and possess the promised land. See, if the original, the first generation of Israelites were alive today and we were to meet them, if they were to come to an Imago Day event, if they were to come to Fusion, if they were to be a part of your connect group, we would probably classify them in our human minds as on fire for God Christians. We would say those, those Israelites are sold out. They're sacrificial. They were free. They knew what it was to be oppressed and under slavery. And God had promised them freedom. And they were living the free life. They had gone through Freedom Connect groups. They had gone through Freedom Conference. And they didn't even recognize the life that they were living outside of slavery. Let's think back. They had given up everything they knew. They had been in slavery for 430 years, generations upon generations in slavery. They gave it all up and left for the promised lands. What you need to know is that they loved God. They knew God. They saw God deliver them through 10 plagues. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw God visibly through cloud and a fire. They grew hungry and thirsty. God provided. See, I have mixed feelings about this. I loved Exodus. It changed my life. I could identify with every character of Exodus. I could identify with Moses. I could identify with Joshua. I could identify with the Israelites. So why did the original Israelites not get to enter into the promised land? The Bible tells us that it was the details of their hearts. In fact, it's things that you and I might classify their sin as little things because it was the simple things like complaining, like grumbling, like disobedience because they were afraid, because they were tired. They had gone through a lot. They were uncomfortable See, Song of Solomon in the Bible, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 15 says this. Catch the foxes for us. The little foxes. The little foxes that spoil, or one translation says ruin the vineyards. For our vineyards are in blossom. Our vineyards are in bloom. Ladies, here's what I want to tell you. The promised land is here. Your vineyard is in blossom. Your vineyard is in bloom. But can I tell you, you've done some major things for God. You've made it a year in this pandemic. You have seen God come through in miraculous ways. You love God and you know God. But can I tell you what can ruin your promised land? What can ruin the blooms of your vineyard? It's not the big things. It's the little things the bible says it is the little foxes see sometimes i think we think it's the lions and the tigers and the bears we're out for the big things we're out for the big addictions we're out for the big um problem the big sin that we see but i think sometimes it's the condition of our heart it's grumbling it's complaining it's self-pity it's despair it's jealousy it's envy it's insecurity it's disobedience it's fear and fear is just a lack of faith how do 
how do I know this? Deuteronomy 1 says this. Moses gives a quick illustration of what happened. And Moses says this about the Israelites. He's writing a quick version. He goes, I said to you, because the Lord spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to the Israelites. And Moses said, I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord, our God, is giving us. See, the Lord, your God, has set the lamb before you. Go up. And take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has told you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. He's talking to the original Israelites. So here is what I know. If Moses had to tell the people, do not be afraid or discouraged, taking the promised land was scary. Taking the promised land was intimidating. It was terrifying. It made them feel weak and insecure. In fact, I think taking the promised land frustrated them. I think it made them feel debilitated. I think that they felt unqualified for this. After all, all they really know how to do was to make bricks upon bricks upon bricks. I think that they felt ill-prepared to be warriors of God to take the land. But if you know the story... The people go and ask Moses, instead of just listening to God and taking the land, they said, why don't we send some spies into the land so that they can report back to us. Let's just get a feel for the land. I want to still go there, but that's another message. And so it says that he sent 12 spies into the land to come back and tell the Israelites about their promised land. And many of you know that 10 came back and said, yeah, the land is amazing. It's the promised land. But the people are giants and they will crush us. Only two of the 12 came back and said, you know what? It's impossible. But God said it, so let's go take it. And so verse 26 um, in Deuteronomy says this. This is Moses talking to the people, the first generation of Israelites. He said, but you were not willing to go up. You rebelled against the commands of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents. You went home and started complaining about the promises of God and what it was going to take. And, you, and said, this is what the people said. The Lord brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites in order to destroy us because he hates us. What? Wow, how our hearts can change and deceive and we can believe things from grumbling, from complaining, from seeing things from the wrong perspective. Verse 28 says, where can we go? They felt stuck. Our brothers have made us lose heart. In other words, our 10 spies that we sent out saying the people are larger and taller than we are. The cities are large, fortified to the heavens. We also saw the descendants of the Anakim there, They're like giant. They say that Goliath was probably a descendant of them. But can I tell you, I'm just going to be really raw. So just if you don't like this raw, just take this out and move on to the next one. As as the readers, me as the readers of the Bible 2,000 years later, let me tell you what I'm screaming at the Israelites. You idiots, take the land. God has promised it to you. What more do you want him to do to prove himself to you? Go take the freaking land. But again, that's like being the Monday morning quarterback for the game that I never played. I'm reading it 2,000 years later. So verse 29 says, so I said to you, don't be afraid or terrified of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he's going to fight for you just as you saw him do in Egypt. Come on, people. We saw God do this 10 times to the Pharaoh of Egypt. If he can do it then, he's going to do it now. And he says, and you saw in the wilderness how the Lord your God, in the wilderness, the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. Oh, man, what a picture of a tender God. What a picture of 
of a graceful God that in the middle of the wilderness, he's still carrying you. You want some manna? Okay, I'll give you some manna. You want some quail? Okay, I'll give you some quail. You're thirsty? Okay, I'll give you, th- I'll give you some water. But they didn't see that. They got their hearts messed up with complaining and grumbling and feeling sorry for themselves. It says, but in spite of all of this, you did not trust the Lord your God who went before you on the journey to seek out a place for you to camp. He went in the fire by night, cloud by the day. So this is what I think. The Bible doesn't say this. But I can see where the Israelites were coming from because I've been there. As I think that the Israelites thought that possessing and entering the promised land was going to be kind of easy. See, let's start to feel sorry for them a little bit. They had dealt with abusive slave masters for 430 years. They had dealt with the terrifying feeling of being at the Red Sea with an army behind them, but they saw they were able to cross the Red Sea. They had been homeless in the desert on what felt like the longest journey of their lives probably homeschooling their kids. <laughs> they dealt with hunger. I know what hangry is. They were thirsty. And I think they thought, we've come through all of that. We're just going to walk into this promised land and we're just going to possess it. Like, like the songs we sing, Shout with the voice of triumph. Like, that's how it's all going to work, God, right? Like, we've been through a lot. We're just going to go, oh, yeah, thank you, Jesus. It's going to feel good, like a Mongo Day kind of service. And then we're just going to walk in. Tonight, when we get into our door, our marriage has been a mess. He's going to walk in with a bouquet of roses and be like, God met me here. I love you. I'm so sorry for everything you've done. And your marriage is just going to be, I mean, like, better than any bachelor at service, bachelor series you've ever seen in your life. Because you think, man, I've been through so much with this man. It should just turn around like this. But they were going to have to fight for it. And they were going to have to fight much more powerful people than they were. And I think they were discouraged. I think that they thought, we're tired. And now We have to fight for our promised land? I don't have it in me. I don't have the fight left in me to do that. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in the front row of church, and Pastor Brendan used Galatians 6, 9 in his message, and it hit me so hard. He said, let us not become weary. The Amplified Bible says, or grow discouraged in doing good. Because of the proper time. The proper time will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I just want to say that I started thinking that's the enemy's tactic. I know it's the enemy's tactic on my life. It's to get me weary. It's to get me tired. It's to get me exhausted. It's to get me burned out, discouraged. Because that's the easiest way to give up, to quit. And when you give up and you quit, you never get to see the harvest. Or you never get to see your promised lands. And so I listened to that message. But the next morning, I went into my quiet time with the Lord. And I said, God, I'm tired. And I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit. I don't want to give up because I know that the promises of God are going to happen. I know that the harvest is going to happen. But please don't let me give up before that moment. So I wrote, how do I stay refreshed, God? How do I stay full of faith? God, how do I stay energized when I'm tired? How do I stay at peace when, let's just be honest, there's some things I'm a little scared about? How do I stay at joy? Count it all joy when all the trials come. Okay, so how do I do that? 
How do I stay humble and not judgmental? All the while waiting with hope on the promise. And then Lent happens, and I opened up Joshua 1. Joshua 1, 3 is the Lord saying, hey, listen, the last people, that first generation, they screwed it up. Second chance, Joshua, you've got this. And this is God's pep talk to Joshua, and this is what he says in verse 3. He gives them the promise again. I'm going to give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Verse 5 says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Uh, Joshua, be strong and be courageous. Verse 7 goes, he says, be strong and very courageous. Jesus knew, God knew, this boy needs a pep talk. This is my man of faith, but I'm going to speak faith into him. I'm going to speak life into him because He's going to do it. He's going to lead this next generation. He says, so the Lord says to him, be careful, Joshua. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. This is life or death before you. Don't play around with this, Joshua. He says that you may be successful wherever you go. Joshua, now is not the time for you to complain or to grumble or you to feel sorry for yourself. But you be strong. You be courageous. You obey every single thing I have said to you. Do not look to the right. Do not look to the left but you stay focused and he says you keep this book of the law always on your lips you meditate on it day and night you don't meditate on Netflix you don't meditate on Instagram you don't meditate on Facebook or TikTok or some stupid trash now is not the time you don't look to the right you don't look to the left you do everything that I've told you to do now is not the time to go and say Well, but this just feels good. But this, I had an addiction to this, but it's the pandemic. How else am I supposed to cope? I got over alcohol 10 years ago. A glass of wine ain't nothing now. Oh yeah, but now you better meditate on the word of God. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. You stay focused on what you're supposed to do. And then you will be prosperous and successful. He, Jesus says, God says to him again, have I not commanded you? Joshua, remember, I am the commander in chief. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Listen. You can go to the right or you can go to the left, but you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years going, why am I bumping this? Why am I bumping that? Why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? Why am I sick to my stomach all the time? Why do I feel like the world's against me? Because you are not focused at attention and saying, Jesus, it's the commander in chief. You need to know who is speaking to Joshua in these verses. Who is speaking? The commander in chief, God himself. So I'm going to answer those questions because God answered them for me in that room that morning. See, Joshua knew how to hear from God. And I want to prove this to you because I want to back it up in Exodus 33. When Joshua was just Moses' assistant, he was nobody. But Moses, this was before the ark was built. See, in the Old Testament, the presence of God had to be inside of an ark. And only the highest priest could access the presence of God. But this was even before the ark was built. And so there was a temporary tent and Exodus 33 verse 7 says, now Moses took a tent and he pitched it outside the camp. The only place you hear from God is where there is no distractions. 
He sat at a distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of the meeting. Oh, I love the tent of the meeting. You know I preached about the tent of the meeting. Just go back and read, look at some YouTube uh, messages from Imago Day. It said anyone who wanted to consult the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting that was outside the camp. This is how powerful that tent was. It says whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the Israelites were like, oh, he's going into the tent to meet with Jesus. Of course, it was God, Jesus in the New Testament, but you know what I mean. And it said when Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up. There was an anticipation of faith in their heart. What is Moses hearing Next, and it said each one of the door, they would just watch because they were able to go into that tent. And so they would watch and as they would watch Moses until he entered the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar, the cloud would go upon that tent. And it would remain at the entrance of the tent. And all people could do, they couldn't enter into the presence of God, but they could be in awe that there would be a man that would go into the tent and would be able to hear from God and experience God and experience his presence. But it says this, that when Moses entered the tent, that pillar of cloud would come down. And it says the Lord would speak with Moses. The Lord would speak with Moses. Verse 10 says, as all the people saw that, they would stand up and bow and worship. It was just an awe for them. Each one at the door of their tent, that's as far close as they could get. And verse 11, verse 11 is the key here. It says, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friends. And then Moses would return to the camp to tell the people what the Lord had said. Oh, but this is good and you need to get this. Sometimes the Bible just puts treasures in there and he hopes you grab it. But it says his assistant, the young man, Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tents. I think Joshua experienced something in there that he thought, unless someone takes me out of the presence of God, I'm not leaving until I get a word from God. So what do you do when you're tired and you're ready to give up? And you know now's not the time to give up because if you do not give up, the harvest is in front of you. You need to know where your tent of the meeting is with God. Women, I am here to tell you that you better have a prayer life right now. You better know the voice of God. How do you know the voice of God? You know it in your word. You get in and you soak. You're here at this event. You're here at this gathering. And this is the voice of God. And I know he is speaking to every single person in these seats. I know my God. And I know how he speaks. You better know how to battle on your knees. You better know how to get in that tent and say, I am not leaving until I hear from you. I am not leaving until I have strength for today. Girlfriend, that means if you go to bed at 8 o'clock at night because you have to get up for work at 5.30 in the morning. And so that means you have to get up at 4.30 to go in your tent of the meeting. It is desperate times. And desperate times call for desperate measures. See, I have a generation behind me of grandparents. Now listen. Listen. It's not all good. There's some divorce. There's some abuse. I had a grandmother that was married to a preacher that beat the crap out of her. And she left him and married someone else that had multiple affairs on her and multiple children. But I had a grandmother that got on her knees and she told me what it was to pray through the night. She said, Danielle, I've prayed until the sun has come up. And because of that, she knew that there was darkness in her life 
life that there was only going to be battled on her knees. Thank God I had a grandmother that knew how to battle on her knees. I believe he speaks through his word. I believe he speaks through people. I believe he speaks through nature. I believe he speaks through music. So what is he saying to you? Are you obeying it? None of us are perfect. It's not in my notes. But as I sat with this heavy word in, in my tent of the meeting, I said, God, search me. Search me. What do I need to bring before you and ask you to forgive me? And I said, God, sometimes I feel like what I want to be is like a precious plate of china. But in the tent of meeting, I feel safe enough to get on my knees and say, this plate is actually broken. Before the world, I put out a plate and it looks good, but I'm kind of holding it together and I know there's cracks in it. But God, in, in your tent, in this safe place, I'm not perfect. And it's kind of a mess. This plate's like pieces. Forgive me for probably not handling and stewarding this well. If you could put it back together. There's a verse in the Bible that says, repent because times of refreshing will come to your soul. And as I sat there and laid sin before God, laid my heart, God, I've complained a lot. I've grumbled a lot. I have felt sorry for myself a lot. God, I haven't been thankful. I haven't. I haven't been content. I'm sorry, God. I felt like a child. Like I really screwed this one up, God. And I felt whew, this refreshing. He goes, that's it. That's it. That's it. Just keep bringing it. Bring the other plates. Go ahead. Just bring all that broken china. There's more in there, Danielle. Go get it all out. You're just bringing one plate, but bring all the set. It's all broken. Yeah, God. And I felt, that's where I want you, Danielle, childlike. I still love you, just like my kids when they come to me and say, Mom, I'm sorry. Oh, you said you're sorry? Come here and let me give you a hug. It's okay. I still love you. Obedience. Here's the second thing I want to tell you. Here's the last thing. You need to have authority much greater than yourself because your enemy is much bigger than you are. See, number 13, the spies, they went into the promised land and the 10 spies reported back and they said, the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. Uh, verse 31 says, we can't attack. We cannot take this land because they are stronger than we are. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. They felt this small to these people. And it says, we must have seemed the same to them. So I read this week, Dr. Tony Evans, I love him. And he said in a football game, the players tower over the referees. 
The players, think about an NFL game. The players are big, man. I mean, those arms, those that chest, that shoulders, they are massive, right? And they are stronger and they are powerful. Just think about the puny little referees on the NFL team. Like they're usually 60, 90 year old men, it seems like out there, completely out of shape. And like, you know, just like in the referee jersey going around, right, making the calls. But here's what I need you to know. In a game, the players can use their power to knock you out because they're bigger. But the referees can use their authority to put you out of the game. Here is what you need to write down. You are never to confuse power with authority. I want to tell you, I want you to put this mic, I need all the monitor I can get. I'm losing my voice and I am about to scream because this has been, I've just wanted to get to this part of this message all night. I love you, Ted. Listen to me, you need to know this. Never, ever confuse power with your authority. Your enemy is bigger than you are. Your enemy, the battle that is in front of you, the addiction that is in front of you, the marriage that is in front of you, the job situation, the financial situation, the kids that are acting out of their mind. You don't even know where they're at tonight and you are worried. It is bigger than you are. It is NFL size, but they only have power. They don't have authority. You have authority. You are tiny. You are a grasshopper. They are much bigger than you. But you have a jersey on. You have the authority of God living inside of you. And you can take out every NFL player and say, you're bigger than I am, but I've got the authority. So in the name of Jesus, I tell you by the power of God, bless him, that you are out of the game. You are out of the game. This is my land. This is my territory. I am tired. I am exhausted. I am done. I've dealt with a year of this pandemic. But let me tell you what. You are more powerful than I am. But by the authority of God in me, in my little house, in my white couch, I'm telling you, get out of here. Depression, out of here. Anxious thoughts, out of here. There is peace in my home. There is joy in my home. But I've got to prove it to you because you've got to get in the word for yourself. Ephesians 2, 5 through 6 says this. You have been made alive with Christ. Even though we were dead, there was a time you had no power. There was a time you had no authority in your life, but you are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and he seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Where are you seated? Where are you seated? Do you see that? You are seated right there with Jesus. He has given you the Jersey girlfriend. Use it, use it. My last verse is Colossians 2, 13 through 14. And this is another, I'm gonna prove it to you in the word that you have authority, that there the enemy is more powerful, but your authority, you can call out any power over your life. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. You did not make yourself alive. Nothing else on this earth made you alive. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of your sins. All of your sins have been forgiven. Listen to me. He has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. You are free. You are free. Which stood against us and condemned us and told us everything that we've been doing wrong. He has taken it away. Oh, listen to this. He's nailing it to the cross. Your sins have been paid, are free. The Passion Translation says this. Oh, I'm losing my voice. Hold on one second, because this is so, so good. I 
told this to Abby. I was like, Abby, this is so good. It says, then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers. I want you to think about all the shame, all the sin in your life. He made a public spectacle on Resurrection Sunday and the principalities of darkness. He stripped away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power. He stripped all deem Satan's authority on Resurrection Sunday. And it says, by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. Oh, Jesus was not his prisoner because what does it say? They were his. Do you get it? He conquered it all on Easter Sunday. He took all authority away from Satan and has given you the same authority. You are free to take your possessed land. You are free to harvest. You are free to enter in. May we enter into worship tonight.